Straight 
Glad you tuned in today. 
Our pastor and some of our staff are recovering from coronavirus, and so today I have the privilege of filling in for them and uh, for Brother James, and I'm glad, glad to do that. I want you to open your Bibles in Romans chapter 12, Romans the 12th chapter. We're going to read two verses and talk about, I want to talk to you about love of the brethren, because even though that's easy to understand, you need to love your brethren. If somebody said, how do you do that? What does it look like? when somebody loves their brethren, when they are a loving member of a church. How do you express that and what does it look like? And I, and I hope that we can learn something about that today. That's, that's my objective at least. But I wanted to start with, um, uh, with a quote that I got from a lady named Jaira Keys. And um, she talked about how overused the word love is. And man, this goes right with what I want to say. And so I know you probably can't read all this, but if you want to, you can. She said, the word love is being overused and in turn seems to be losing its value. When something gets used, it is no longer worth what it originally was. That's why used cars are cheaper. <laughs> That's why used clothing is cheaper. When something gets used, it's no longer worth what it originally was. If something is repeated multiple times without purpose or actual reason, does it not lose its significance? The word love is being used at the wrong time and in the wrong context. We tend to say that we love food, clothing, television shows, movies, shopping, and I put in there, she didn't put this, but I put in there hamburgers and pizza, even colors. All of those things actually don't mean much to most of us. We may be very fond of these things, but to say we love them would actually be an overstatement. And so I wanted to begin talking about love of the brethren by having you think about the fact that it's hard to even define love. Uh, most of us know that, that the Lord Jesus talked about love and how we should love our brethren. In fact, in John 13, 34, Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you that you also love one another. He was talking to his disciples. That was a church that he had formed together. And, and so he said to them, I want you to love one another just like I loved you. And so I'm telling you today, if you're a part of a church body, you're to love the other members of that church body, just as Jesus loved you. That's the pattern. You're not to love others as they love you, but you're to love others as Jesus loves you. And that makes quite a difference. Another verse that uh, comes to mind is 1 John 4, 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And that's pretty clear. John wrote both of those passages, one quoting Jesus, one later in his first epistle about loving one another. Now, the reason that love is important in a church, our Lord Jesus also touched on this, because love among the brethren was a unique mark in that assembly. In fact, it was a, it was a mark that the whole world would recognize that these people are disciples of Jesus. In fact, let me read you what he said. It's in John 13, 35. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Wow, that's kind of neat. Because he didn't say all men will know you're my disciples if you got the right name on your church building or if you have the right, this particular doctrine or this particular belief or this particular activity, they will know you are my brothers, that you're my church. He said, listen, here's the thing. All men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And then in John 17, when Jesus was praying to his heavenly father, this is really the Lord's prayer in John 17, verse 20 and 21. Jesus prays that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Listen to this so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The testimony of a church in its community that Jesus sent them is that they love one another. Isn't that something? That's unique. That's unusual. That's scriptural. That's biblical. That's why all of us need to really focus on loving one another in a church family as we obey the Lord. Now, I know that 
love is hard to define. And, and I think this is probably the best definition I've ever heard of it. And it isn't really, you won't find it in a dictionary. But I think this is the best definition because you just, it's just hard to describe love, hard to define love. Love, to me, is to always show the highest and best for the object that is loved. In other words, if you say you love somebody, you're always seeking the highest and the best for that person you love. If you love your wife or your husband or your children or your family or your church or members in your church, then according to this definition, if you love them, you're always seeking the highest and the best for them. You don't want to distract from them. You don't want to detract. You don't want to bring them down. You're always looking for the highest and the best for them. And that's certainly the way it should be. In fact, I think that's what the Lord Jesus had in mind in John 15, 13, when he said, greater love is no man than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. I don't know about you. I have never been called to lay down my life for my friend. I have never been called to do that. I have a son in the Marine Corps, and he believes this because he loves and he defends our country and he's willing, been in Iraq and Afghanistan, willing to lay it on the line. I've never experienced that, where I've had to lay down my life for somebody else. That's obvious because I'm here. But what I want you to think about is this, the kind of love that would cause you to lay down your life for somebody means that you're willing to sacrifice yourself for that person. It means that you're willing to give up your life it means you're willing to give up your will. It means you're willing to give up your pride for the benefit of that other person. And man, that's what real love is all about. And I think this verse and that definition is really what we want to go with today. So I want to just share with you from the Bible. Uh, we're looking at Romans 12, verse 9 and 10. If you have your Bible, then can follow along. I urge you to do that. Listen to what Paul writes. He said, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. So if I would ask you, what does it look like? What does it look like when, when, when we love the brethren, when we love one another the way we should? And I think there are four characteristics in verse 9 and 10 of what this love looks like, how it appears, um, what it means to love your brethren. First of all, it means to love them genuinely. In the very verse 9, the very first part of that verse, he said, let love be without hypocrisy. There is nothing, almost nothing worse in this world than hypocritical love. I mean, I, I don't mind that people who wouldn't like me if they tell me to my face, you know, I don't like you. But you know what really hurts is if somebody pretends that they love you and they're hypocritical about it. Man, that would hurt more than somebody who just didn't like me at all. I wouldn't care so much about that. And neither would you. Hypocritical love is hurtful and harmful. And that's why one of the characteristics of love among the brethren is that we love them genuinely, not hip hypocritically. In fact, the Greek word hypocrisy, and it's found right here in verse 9, Romans 12, 9, let love, love be without hypocrisy. That word for hypocrisy was a, was a theatrical term. And it, was, it, it meant literally speaking behind a mask. And you remember in the old Greek theater and later in the Roman theater, when there would be a play on stage and they would have a drama and they would, instead of changing costumes, they would put in front of their face a mask. And it would be a smiling mask or a frowning mask or an angry mask. And the word hypocrisy means to speak from behind a mask. Man, that's a good definition of the wrong kind of love. That's why we need to love each other genuinely, not hypocritically. When someone pretends to love you but doesn't, then that really hurts. And you know, this kind of hypocrisy, hypocritical love, has no place in, ch in the church. We are not to pretend that we love one another. It ought to be a genuine thing. In fact, when we're talking about what does love of the brethren, how does it appear? What is to love somebody genuinely, not hypocritically? Christian love is to be without hypocrisy. Real love, genuine love, 
is to do, remember the, our definition of love, is to do whatever brings out, is for the best and brings out the best in that person. Not which drags them down, but always that which seeks the highest and the best for the object of that love. In fact, 1 Peter 1.22, Peter said this, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from a, from a pure heart. And he used that term. You have purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, a genuine love of the brethren. He said, see that you fervently love one another. You know, what I'm saying is this. I, I know every church is made up of different kinds of people and different backgrounds and all kinds of different temperaments and um, history. We all have our own history of things. But you know, when we come together in a church body, we're to love one another genuinely. And that is, he said, even fervently, we're to show that kind of love for one another. Unhypocritical Christian love is love without disguise. It's without pretense. Um, how much better church would be if people loved each other and didn't fake it, you know, if they just loved each other without hypocrisy. To love genuinely means always to seek the best for the object of love. I love what Peter said, too. Peter wrote 1 Peter 4, 8, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. The truth of it is, is that when you love somebody, you're willing to forgive them. In fact, you're even anxious to forgive them when they offend you or they offend others. Peter said, we need fervent love in our church family because it covers a multitude of sins. That does not mean that if you love somebody, they have a license to go out and sin. What it does mean is, is that you are willing to be the first one on board offering a hand of forgiveness, a hand of reception. That's what it means. That's loving genuinely, unhypocritically. And he said, let it be that kind of a fervent love. And wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be great if we expressed to one another in our church, in Pauline Baptist Church, or in your church, whichever church you're a member of, wouldn't it be great if we expressed our love for one another? That is, let it be known. Um, let it be heard. Let it be shown. Straightforward, honest, no hypocrisy, developing a genuine love and appreciation for each other. And I think that's what all of this comes from this part of loving them genuinely. If you have your Bible, I want you to notice one other thing in verse 9. He said, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. You see, real love doesn't cover up sin. You're supposed to abhor that which is evil. To abhor means that you're to hate it. Uh, you express your hatred for that. And you're to love and to cling to that which is good. Let's look at the second thing. If we're going to love the brethren that it means that we must love them genuinely. It also means we must love them devotedly. He says in verse 10, look at this, Romans 12, 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. And I, and I love that. Be devoted to one another. Man, devotion is a very high, precious commodity in a church. Our devotion to one another, our love for one another, that is we love each other genuinely, and we're to be devoted to one another. The word devoted in the original language is, it was always used of a love, of a mutual love of parents for their children, of a husband and wife for one another, or of children for their parents or parents for their children. And it was, it was the strongest familial love, this being devoted. The word devoted carries the idea of, of something that is cherished. Um, something that is held high, uh, something that is uh, that you treat with tenderness and you hold up. Man, I love all of those uh, all of those synonyms describing what devoted means. It's kind of like when you handle a newborn. Um, in our family, we had five five children, five babies, and I remember very clearly when those. When those babies would come home and Pat would bring home that baby, I was always more comfortable when she was holding the baby. <laughs> because, I mean, it's not that I'm a klutz, but, but man, I always thought, you know, that baby is so fragile. And, and man, when you hold it, if you're a parent, you know what that's like. That precious, cherished, 
child. That's the word for devotedly. We cherish them. And it's interesting that when he's talking, Paul is talking in Romans 12, not about a family so much, but he's using a family word. And he's talking about a church, how a church is to love each other, cherish each other, highly value and prize each other, not demean each other, not run each other down, not ignore, not be rude, but to really cherish one another. In fact, that beautiful word, devoted, is just there. And you know, when you cherish someone, you hold them up and you never seek to tear them down. You would not want anyone tearing down your children, tearing down your spouse, your mate. In fact, you just wouldn't allow it. I wouldn't allow that. Don't you speak that way about my love because I'm devoted to them. I cherish them. And here, friends, Paul uses that word and he projects it onto the church family that we are to be toward one another cherishing our fellowship, cherishing our time, cherishing who we are in our devotion, in our love for one another. Imagine what our church fellowship would be like if we were devoted to one another, if we cherished one another, if we tenderly took care of one another, treating one another special and different. We live in a small town in Monticello, and most of you that are watching this are live here in Monticello. And I've heard it said by some pastors, and it's absolutely true, that uh, before this pandemic hit, that you could do your church visitation in Walmart. You know, if you go to Walmart, you run into, you run into all, all kinds of church members. And I'm going to use this for an illustration because we're to love each other devotedly. When I run into fellow church members at Walmart, I want you to know I treat them differently than I treat other people that I know. In other words, I'm not saying I treat other people rudely or poorly. I hope I don't do that. But, but when I see one of my brothers or sisters in Christ, in my church family, in Walmart or in some other place, man, I take time. I stop what I'm doing and I shake their hand and I ask them how they're doing. I talk to them because it's because there is a, there's an, there's an, a level of devotion in a church family where love is somewhere, something that we cherish being with one another. There are people in Pauline Baptist Church that I can name you that I, man, I love them more than I love anybody in the world. And I'm not trying to be, not trying to be picky, but I'm just saying that there is a special level of love that we need, that devotion to one another. I want you to look at the third thing. Um, I forgot to put the scripture when he said, be devoted one to another. The third thing is this, we're not only love genuinely and devotedly, but we're to also love brotherly. Ah, in your Bible, look at this. In verse number 10, he said, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Now, I don't have to tell you that there always is a natural, deep devotion in, fam in uh, physical family ties. In fact, there's an old saying that, that says, it's true, that blood is thicker than water. When somebody says that, what they mean is this. What they mean is, in a family, the relationships and loyalties are the strongest and the most important. They're stronger and more important than ties that are outside the family. When somebody says blood's thicker than water, they mean, yeah, a family just sticks together. We're the same blood. I mean, we're the same genetic makeup. We, we, we've known each other our whole lives and we, we've been around each other in the, the good, bad, and the ugly, the thick and the thin, you know. We've been through things together and we love one another. And there's that kind of devotion that's not like anywhere else. Now, I'm saying that to say this, that there is a natural deep devotion in physical family ties. Now you translate that into what he's saying. He said, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, in brotherly love. There is to be, there isn't the same, but it's to be similar to familial devotion and loyalty and uh, just our uh, honesty with one another in a, in a church family as there is in a physical family. Now, here what he's talking about is that we are to have 
family affection to one another in our church family. That's why it's called a church family. In fact, I think what he's talking about is that we, we are to treat our brothers and sisters in the church just like you would your family. And I don't mean be exactly, you don't have to carry that all the way out. I mean, when we go home, I take my shoes off and put my feet up and I wouldn't want to go to your house if you're a fellow church member and do that. So I'm not going to treat it exactly the same, but in many ways, we are to treat our church family. We are to be close to our church family and love them brotherly just like we do in our, in our physical family. It doesn't mean you always agree with them. Man, in a family, there are disagreements sometimes. But you know when the chips are down, a family stands together. And that's what it should be in a church family. It doesn't mean we won't disagree, but it just simply means we will stand with each other. In our house, in our family, uh, God has blessed us in tremendous ways in my home. And I'm so thankful for my family and my kids. I'll tell you that I would not be any the person I am today if it, if it were not for my children raising kids you learn a lot you get a whole education and it grows you up we had three sons and two daughters and you know they did not always agree with one another but to this day they'll fight for each other because they're loyal to each other you can't say you can't run down one of their siblings and have them not defend that sibling now, they may disagree with their sibling, but man, when the chips are down, they're loyal to their, to their family. They're loyal to their siblings. Now, physically, in a church, we are not physically a family, but we are spiritually a family. In fact, the Bible teaches that because we've been born again, that we're in the same family. And because we are covenanting together as born-again children of God, baptized, following Jesus, we're covenanting together in this church body that we are a church family. And is that we are to treat one another genuinely and devotedly and brotherly, just like the loyalty that runs in a family we are to have in our church. In fact, Galatians 3.26 says, you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And you know, we need to show the same kind or similar loyalty and devotion to our brothers and sisters in Christ in the same in, in our church. The same kind of care, the same kind of compassion, the same kind of loyalty that is seen in our families is, is to be translated right into our church family. Now that brings us to the fourth thing. In Christ Jesus, we are to love one another in our church family. How you love the brethren? By loving them genuinely, not hypocritically, devotedly, brotherly, with loyalty. Also, love them preferentially. I'm not sure that is a word. It is. In fact, Ryan Capico's filming. Is that a word, Ryan, you reckon, preferentially? It is. Okay, well, we'll say it's a word. Ryan Capico said it's a word. We're to love one another preferentially. And I think he talks about this in the last part of that, where he said, give preference to one another in honor. Isn't this great? This is wonderful. This is the way that you can see and recognize brotherly love. It is when we prefer one another, when we love them preferentially. That is to show genuine appreciation and admiration for fellow believers in a church by putting them first, by putting them first. You know that um, in Philippians 2, 3, Paul writing about Jesus, before he talked about Jesus and his humility and his preferential treatment of others, he talked about to the church and he talked about to the Philippians and to every believer when he said this. Philippians 2, 3 says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Man, that is great. And then he went on and said, that's exactly what Jesus did. In fact, he said, let this mind be in you that was, was also in Christ. And what he said was that we were to treat one another with preference. In fact, when he said, don't do things out of selfishness. A selfish person is, is one who says, I want my way, my way or the highway. Uh, that isn't loving the brethren. We're to love one another preferentially 
And when he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. And man, I can just see the beautiful uh, application of this in a church is that a church is made up of people who are constantly pre preferring others. They're letting others lead and others stand up and encouraging others to lead out in things. And in fact, that's what preference is. It's preferring another person. Now, am I saying you don't have talent? I don't have talent. I couldn't do it myself. Yeah, you can do it yourself. But listen, if we're going to love the brethren, we need to treat them with preference. And there's times when we need to say, I'll go with you. What you're saying we need to do, you lead and we'll follow. That's what church is all about. You don't have a whole church full of people, everybody leading in a different direction. What you need is a church full of people who will say, yes, I love Jesus and let's together go forward. And we treat one another with preference. Simply put, if you love your church family, you won't demand your way. And this is kind of tough sometimes, but it's true. If I love my church family, I'm not always going to be the one that says, I've got to have my way or I'm going to leave. Well, that's not the way. The, to, to love the brethren is to love them preferentially, giving preference to one another. And man, this is so beautiful when you see it work. You will prefer others. Let them go first to take the lead. And you know, that's just the opposite of how people normally act. Normally, we say, me first. But a Christian especially one who loves their brethren in a church, will say, you first, not me first. In fact, that's the way it is. In fact, that's the ideal for the Christian to act. So what we're coming down to is just this, in conclusion, is that when it comes to loving the brethren, and I hope that you'll think about that today. If you're part of a church family, I hope you'll think about these things. How can I improve my love for my brothers and sisters in Christ? How can I be what Jesus said? All men will know you are my disciples if you have love one to another. How can I show them what will it look like? When I love them without hypocrisy, when I love them with devotion and cherish them, when I love them brotherly like I would my own physical brother, be loyal to them, defend them, when I love them preferentially, preferring them, not demanding my own way, then when I do those four things, I will manifest what it's like to love the brethren. So that kind of a generic love the brethren is actually you put shoes on it right here. Here's where you see it take action. Here's where the rubber meets the road. And I hope you'll think about it today and pray about it this week. If you know Christ is your Savior and you're part of a church family, Man, my desire for in preaching this sermon is so that you'll think about how you can do these things, how you can, with God's help, put them into effect in your life so that your church membership and your church family will experience joy and hospitality and love like never before. Because when, we're, when we all do this, our church family will be blessed. And let me just close by saying this. No one can love like that, except they know the one, the only one who loves like that. In other words, you look at those four things and you say, man, I, I, can't, I don't know if I can do that. And I, and I know I fail over here and there and there and there sometimes because sometimes I don't do those things. And well, let me tell you one who did. The one who did those things is the one who saves us. The only one who perfectly loves in fact, there's a beautiful picture of this in 1 John 4. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. In describing God's love, I love the fact that he said, this is how we know he loved us because he sent his son to die for us. The same one in John 15 that said, greater love is no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The same thing John said, God proves his love for us 
when he sent his son to die for our sins. And so I hope today that uh, two things. One is if you are a believer in Christ and a member of a church, I hope that you will exercise those four things, that you'll ask God's help and practice them. And then secondly, if you're listening this morning and you have never trusted Christ as your Savior and you say, well, you know, boy, I would love to be a part of a church that practiced those things. You may not find the perfect church. There is no perfect church because we're made up, churches are made up of people that are not perfect. But there is a perfect Savior that you can have who met all of those needs and he died for you. Let me pray for us. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the few minutes we've had today. And Lord, we thank you for this Lord's day where we can just uh, stop for a few minutes. And this is odd. We need to be in church today. We need to be sitting in a pew or we need to be in an assembly singing and listening. And so Lord, this is different. But Father, we thank you that even though we're not physically assembled in a church building, that we can hear your word and we can respond to the conviction of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray today, first of all, for, for people listening who may not know Christ, Lord, help them to realize that Jesus died for them to forgive their sins and to save their souls and to give them heaven for sure. And I pray, Lord, that they will turn to you and repent of their sins and trust Christ. For those of us, Lord, who know you and who are trying to serve you, Lord, I pray that you would make us, just change us, Lord, and make us the kind of church members who really love the brethren in physical ways, in realistic ways, in visible ways that we can, others can see the love that we have for one another and glorify you. And that's what it's all about. We want to glorify you today. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope you have a great week. Hey guys, man, what a great message. Uh, thanks, Brother Larry, for sharing that with us. Uh, on that note, just a really quick way maybe to apply um, this message to uh, our everyday lives, especially our current situation. Uh, man, as a staff, we're recognizing a need uh, to connect with you and for you to connect with other people and uh, it's just a natural tendency I think at this point for people to lean out and lean away and get disconnected uh, and we recognize that uh, without healthy spiritual community uh, that's one of those ways that uh, can lead to other things and so um, man what we'd love for you to do is uh, maybe just do this uh, take a minute right now and just ask the Lord to bring somebody to mind, maybe in our church family, maybe that you haven't seen in a while in the community, uh, and maybe write that down and, and make a, a commitment and an effort uh, this week to just reach out. Maybe it's a text message, maybe it's uh, a phone call, maybe it's dropping something on their, on their doorstep. Um, Anyway, we would just encourage you to reach out, connect with each other, connect with us. If there's any way we can pray for you, if there's any way that we can um, serve you guys in, in any way, we would love to do that uh, at this time. But I think that would be just a great way to apply uh, the, the message that we heard today uh, from Brother Larry. And um, uh, so I encourage you to do that and uh, do that in ways that uh, maybe God would prompt you uh, this next week. Have a couple things before we close out our, our service and our time online. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we've got, of course, this is kind of a strange time. Uh, the staff uh, will be meeting on Tuesday uh, to discuss next Sunday. And uh, right now, it's a little up in the air as to whether or not we'll be uh, online or in person or online and in person. Uh, but uh, stay tuned, okay, to our normal uh, modes of information through the email, through our social media. We'll let you know uh, as soon as we come to a decision. Uh, please be in prayer uh, for all of that. We're so um, thankful that uh, God is, is, is moving and working, and we're thankful that the, the Taylors and the Palmers are, are, are maybe on the, the upswing uh, from uh, the coronavirus and feeling sick, and so we're thankful that they're feeling better. Um, but obviously, that all of that affects uh, us um, 
uh, as a church meeting. And so be in prayer for that. Pray that the Lord would uh, just continue to work and move, that he would protect, that he'd heal, uh, and Lord, that the Lord would just give us wisdom uh, too in, in what to do in these, these coming weeks. Uh, just a strange time, right? You guys know. Um, so by way of announcement, some of the things maybe you're aware of, uh, we decided to go ahead and postpone UAM Sunday, which was going to be next uh, Sunday. Uh, and we're going to do and wait for that. Uh, things to maybe settle down and, and when we can gather with our UAM family, we'll, we'll uh, make another date for that. So uh, stay tuned for that. We wanted to let you know that that was coming up uh, as well. Uh, we did go ahead and bump uh, our Educator Appreciation Sunday and Prayer to the 23rd. And so uh, those of you that are educators out there, we've got a little form, online form we'd love to fill out so we can know what to pray for. Uh, we can know what meet needs uh, that need to be met. Uh, so be looking for that. If you haven't got that, please let me know. I'd love to forward that to you. But we're going to take some time, whether we're online or in person, we're going to take some time uh, just to recognize our educators. We're going to take some time to pray over our educators and our kids because the next day, the next day, the 24th, right, is the beginning of school. Um, another announcement is Brother James's last Sunday uh, as lead pastor is going to be August the 30th. And so he'll be uh, sharing his, his last message, but also uh, maybe casting a little vision for uh, these next steps for him and his family. And so we encourage you over the next couple of weeks, if you have questions, to reach out to them. Uh, if you have uh, just want to, to bless them, I, I'd encourage you to do that in these next couple of weeks. But we'll take some time uh, to honor them on the 30th and also uh, just pray over them. So that's coming up. Uh, also, we'll have a business meeting on September the 13th, uh, the Lord willing. Uh, we've got uh, some of the things that we need to discuss. And, and of course, we'll get the information on the agenda out a couple of weeks before then. Uh, but uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our transition as a church into uh, this interim phase uh, between pastors. And so there'll be some recommendations from our personnel committee, and we're grateful for their work uh, these last few weeks. And then also uh, some recommendations when it comes to uh, transitioning Brother James out uh, as lead pastor. And so uh, we encourage you to be a part of that. I know missions committee will have some announcements there too, but that's coming up on the 13th. That's the second Sunday. Uh, we'll give you details on, on where that's going to be and what time uh, as we get a little bit closer to that. But we wanted to let you know that that was coming up. Uh, those are all the announcements for this week. Um, I'd encourage you, uh, for those of you that have uh, been giving, we're so thankful that you've been giving online or bringing it by the church or sending it through the mail. Uh, we are so thankful for your faithfulness and we are thankful for uh, the Lord putting it on, on your heart to give. And we just encourage you to continue to do that uh, as obviously it's part of our functioning as a church, but it's also good for your and our spiritual health. And so um, we encourage you to continue to give. Uh, as the video ends, there'll be information on how you can do that. Uh, but again, thank you for joining us. If you're a guest with us, thanks again for checking us out. Please let us know if there's anything that we can do to serve you guys. Otherwise, have a great week and we'll talk to you soon.